Good morning, good afternoon, welcome. Hello to all of you who are joining me for this creative conversation. I'm Marita Golden, and I wanna welcome you to this creative conversation with Leslie C. Youngblood and Caroline Brewer. Today, we're going to be talking about black children's books, stories for black children, and why they matter. But before we get into um, our conversation, I wanted to take a moment to congratulate everyone who won a Pulitzer Award. The Pulitzer Awards were announced yesterday, yesterday evening. And I was very pleased to see that a number of extraordinary black writers were honored. Uh, the playwright, Katori Hall, as well as the writers, uh, Tamara, Payne and Les Payne. Les Payne was a journalist who worked for 30 years on the book, The Dead Are Arising, The Life of Malcolm X. Um, I read it, it's an extraordinary book, totally worthy of a Pulitzer. But I'm especially pleased that a young brother, uh, Mitchell S. Jackson, won a Pulitzer for feature writing for an amazingly powerful story that he wrote about the life and death of Ahmaud Aubrey the young uh, black man who was jogging in Atlanta and who was killed by three white men. So I just wanted as a writer, as a fan of literature, to share that with you and also urge you to, um, to check on the Pulitzer list and to read that work. So let's get started. Uh, as I said, today's topic is black children's literature and why those stories matter. And I wanna welcome everybody on Facebook. And if you have a comment or a question, you can simply type it into the comment section. And about halfway through, we'll begin taking comments and questions. Walter Dean Myers, Virginia Hamilton, Mildred D. Taylor, Sharon Draper, Eloise Greenfield, Jacqueline Woodson, Jason K. Reynolds, Kwame Alexander, those are the names of some of the most impactful and groundbreaking black authors in children's literature. Today, I'll be talking to two writers who are carrying on and expanding that tradition of excellence as master storytellers, creating stories of black children's lives and making those stories matter. Both Leslie and Caroline write books for middle grade readers. And those are readers who are upper elementary school sixth and seventh grade. Leslie C. Youngblood is the award-winning author of the middle grade novels Love Like Sky and the forthcoming Forever This Summer. Her honors include the Laurie and Hemingway Short Story Prize and the Go On Girl Book Club Aspiring Writer Award. Caroline Brewer writes picture books and middle grade books. She's a teacher, the author of 13 books, including children's picture books and an education, she's also an education consultant. Her books include Darius Daniels' Game On and Barack Obama, A Hip Hop Tale of a King's Dream. I want to welcome you, Caroline, and welcome you, Leslie. Hey. Hey, Hello. thank you so much for having us. I'm so thank glad you're doing this. Um, I want to start by asking both of you to talk about how you became authors of children's books. What was your writer's journey? How did you become an author? And, and who was your, who and what were your inspiration? Let's start with Caroline. Well, it's a very interesting story. I, in a lot of ways, consider myself an accidental children's book author. I uh, grew up with a mother who loved to tell stories uh, as, as, as part of a way of imparting life lessons. And I didn't know the impact that was having on me until uh, after working as a journalist for um, about 16 years, I left my career and it was uh, the summer of, of 2001 when 9-11 um, happened. And I wrote a poem about that and shared it with a second grade teacher and she really wanted me to share it with her second grade students. So I thought it was important to change the story in a way that would work for young children. And I published the book, Cara Finds Sunshine on a Rainy Day. And the rest, as I say, is history. The, the, the 
the response to the book was so strong. Uh, children and teachers asked me to write new books. And wow. That's how I began to explore it. Great, great. Um, Leslie? And Leslie and I go way back, way we back. Do. And, <laughs> and in um, fact, the, her first book has a very interesting genesis. So I'll, I'll let's get started. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm on my cell phone, which is a little awkward. I'm traveling. So if, it's, if I'm moving around a lot, that's why I'm in a, a public space, unfortunately. But thank you so much for having me, Marita. And good to see you again, um, Carolyn. I, I, I really identify with the, I guess, accidental children's book writer. But I really think that I have written manuscripts, adult lit manuscripts, and it was when a, a middle grade voice came to me, um, really that said, trust this voice, trust this story that is coming to you and write from that point of view. So that would be the genesis of For, um, for Love Light Sky, which was my uh, first book. Now, I think that the, the, the power to really trust, to write middle grade, was something that I, I didn't have after I'm losing myself. I, I didn't have that after my MFA. I was strictly fo focused on adult work. So the understanding that these stories were important, that they were powerful, and that I was selected, chosen to tell my first novel um, about sibling love and, and family and friendship. So that's pretty much how it came about for Love Like Sky. And you mentioned MFA, so you went, you had, you went into an MFA program, a Master of Fine Arts program. Right, a Master of Fine Arts program at uh, uh, UNC Greensboro. And prior to that, I had workshopped. I honestly, and of course, Marita, you know, as you say, we do go way back. I was a, a attendee and won money to attend Hearst and Wright. So that summer workshop, that was before I published I Love Light Sky. So that really, that community, that space to create, to write, and to be edited and workshop from people who looked like me. I was the only black person in my MFA program. So even though I was receiving feedback, it was really a different experience to get feedback from people that I didn't have to explain things to. I didn't have to, um, I didn't have to explain what locks were or things of that nature <laughs> that are dreadlocks. Something that simple gives you power and makes you understand that your stories are valued and important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I want to say at this point that, you know, I've read um, both of your work and, you know, Darius Daniels is a book that is written in verse. And um, I found it. And, you know, the funny thing about children's literature is that it has to appeal both to the adults who buy the book as well as the children who are going to read the book. And um, I found Darius a book written all in verse about a young boy who gets sucked into his computer world. Absolutely fascinating, a wonderful read. And um, Leslie's books, um, Forever This Summer and Love Like Sky about a, a young girl. Um, I think it's the same girl in both books. A just very sweet, tender, looks at black life. You know, so I highly recommend them. I think this is a good point where I think it would be good to give the audience a little taste of your stories. So Caroline, um, you're gonna read a, little, a brief section for us. Yep, let's show this. It's a cover of Darius Daniels' Game On. And as Marita said, it's a book in tone and verse of more than 10 forms of poetry. It's about an 11 year old boy named Darius who gets sucked into his video game. And so in the beginning, we learn about Darius. Darius. Um, so he wakes up one morning when there should have been a warning, and that's the first chapter. That morning, when there should have been a warning, he was ready. Ready to drift back into a cozy sleep, ready to keep, keep dreaming, keep, keep seeing when he remembered, it was the first day of winter vacation. D, whose name is Darius Daniels, has large brown eyes and a soft brown face that make him recline, give him grace. 
and D, skinny as a pencil, seems younger than 11. D doesn't talk much, doesn't smile much, but when he does smile, whoa, you can't hit the B tech. Seems like the sun busts loose from the clouds. Fast, proud, D listens to his mom and his big brother Jalen most of the time. He only pretends to be up on his little sister Ashanti. His mind isn't wired to hurt people, though sometimes he does when he feels sick. D's not the worst student, not the best, doesn't hate school, doesn't even hate tests. What does D love? Games. He says, they the best. When D thinks of games, how good they can be, he can hear and fill his eyes until he cannot see. What does D hate? His daddy, a tall man nicknamed Jojo Slim, who would play with him and say to him in his slow talking deep voice, I love you, my little man. Daddy loves you. D's daddy, Jojo Slim, one day up and left him, left him wandering rooms in his home against a backdrop that was quiet as a stone, calling his name. Daddy, 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 calling and getting no answer. So that's how we learn about D. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, I, and that's the, children's books increasingly for the last 20, 30 years have not shied away from giving the children who are the heroes, the heroines of the stories, deep wounds that they are struggling to heal from. And in this case, it's the um, abandonment um, by his father of Darius. Very poignant, very moving. Um, Leslie? Leslie, did we lose you? Well, okay, we're having a, I guess we're having a technical challenge um, because Leslie was, is traveling, she's on the road and um, she's in a public space, but I'm assuming that we will get her back. Um, Caroline, when we were talking in preparation for this conversation today, both you and Leslie shared with me the comment that a black child is more likely to see an image of an animal in a book than an image of themselves. And I wanted you to talk about, you know, particularly because you're not just a writer of children's books, but you're an education consultant and all of that. Um, the challenges of once you've written a black children's book, getting that book into the hands of its intended audience, getting that book into schools, libraries, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, we have in this country what is called a literary canon. And these are books that uh, librarians, the publishing industry, uh, booksellers, um, academia have decided are, are, are valuable uh, and should be passed on to gen by, from generation to generation. And so black authors have always had to compete with that canon. And so while one measure of success is to see more books published by black authors featuring black characters, um, that success is measured against the book's acceptance by uh, people commonly considered gatekeepers of the literary canon. And what we know uh, th across American culture and American history is that uh, when institutions are majority white, uh, the values and traditions that they um, share and, and keep intact are those traditions that come from their experiences. Our experiences, the experiences of people of color are not valued. Um, they're not understood. Uh, they're not recognized. They're not appreciated. They're not honored. Uh, and so that is a challenge that Black writers uh, face with uh, stories about Black children and their experiences. And, and, and so growing up, <laughs> you know, as a Black girl, a Black boy, not seeing yourself reflected in books which 
communicate value, um, communicate value about your life, about your intelligence, about your, your art, your family, you know, everything that, that has a value on it culturally is communicating in books and literature. And so to not see that says to a child that they shouldn't value who they are. They, they struggle with their identity. And that's, that's what Darius Daniels is all about. It ultimately is this uh, child's struggle to identify rightly. And, and, and so um, it is so important that we continue to push for stories about black children so that children can see themselves reflected in ways that support their growth and development, especially intellectually. Well, let's talk about, because I think it's really important to be very specific. Um, for example, when you do a children's book, um, hi, Leslie. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. We're just rolling along, rolling along. Uh, we were talking about the challenges of getting black children's books into the hands of black children. Um, that is, black children's books are published and then they're, they're purchased, I assume, by schools, purchased by libraries, as well as purchased by parents. So, um, Carolyn was just weighing in on that issue of getting books, your books, into the hands of, of Black readers. Right. You know, we can do everything that we can do into the hands of our readers, but, you know, when it comes down to it, we're just one person. When it comes, we have to understand that not every child comes from a household of avid, avid readers. I didn't, you know, I love my family, but we were mostly oral. My mom and my family were not ones to read a lot. That's why I got exposed to a lot of the great that was out there um, in my teens. So we would have to, make, you know, we would have to do what we need to do as far as getting books into the hands of kids. Um, I, I like to share an experience. Also when Once I was in Barnes & Noble, I was uh, assigning books and there was a woman who was being, buying a book for her, you know, for a friend. And, you know, she was a, a, a white lady and there was her daughter standing there, probably would have been a good reader of the book. And because I guess she wasn't a black kid, she didn't think she wanna read that book. So we have, we have that issue with getting them into white kids' hands, of course, books are universal. But also for black children, we just have to understand they may not, the library, of course, are our go-tos to get them um, to, to children. But, you know, I, I just, I like to do a lot of ground roots work as far as getting my books out there. And, and that's just what I would suggest for a lot of us to do. Mm -hmm. um, how has the, you know, and then you have the success of people like, Kwame Alexander, uh, Jason Reynolds, Jacqueline Woodson, who are huge bestsellers and sort of, you know, paving the way. How has the current sort of Black Lives Matter um, landscape or how has all that impacted the world of children's literature? Caroline? What we're seeing is that there is a tremendous amount of discussion about books uh, by uh, Black authors and about Black characters um, uh, since the murder of George Floyd. Um, it's, it's sad that it took that kind of incident to put, put Black writers and Black stories uh, front and center. But um, I, I think we talked about, I've been a subscriber to publish weekly for more than um, 10 years. I get it every week. And I cannot remember ever seeing uh, more than one book announced by a Black author um, you know, over the course of several weeks. But I looked at one issue in May, and there were at least four, maybe five books that were announced as having been written by Black authors. So. Um, it says that things are speeding up 
uh, and that there is more now than there's ever been on um, promoting the stories of Black authors and, and stories about Black children uh, is a part of that. One interesting thing, uh, fact I came across is that 100% of children's books about Asian characters are written by Asian writers. It's 96% for the Latinx community. It is only 45% for Black and African Americans. So even though there are more books that are being published with Black children stories, only half, less than half, of the writers are Black. So that's very troubling. Mm. Mm. You, I think you also mentioned that there was a problem with illustrators, that that there's such an interest now in in Black children's books that there aren't enough Black illustrators. Caroline, I think you said that at one point. Yes, absolutely. Um, you talked about the fact that I just signed my first publishing deal with a, with a major publisher. And what uh, they told me right away was, one of the challenges of getting this book out into the marketplace as quickly as they would like to is the fact that there's a dearth of Black illustrators. So um, clearly there's plenty of Black artists out there who are capable of illustrating children's book, but there has been a demand for them because there wasn't a, a demand uh, in the public's eyes for Black children's stories. Right. Uh, Leslie? Did you want to weigh in on that? Part of what Carolyn was saying as far as the number of black writers who write uh, telling a black story, I think one of the issues is that our culture seems so accessible to everyone. And well, it, it, it is, and you know, and black culture dominates mainstream. And going back to my MFA program, it's that so many people, non-Black, when I was, they want to make sure to a Black person. So it seems like the culture is is just because, of, I, I don't know, because of the access, because of how people think that they, quote unquote, know the stories, that they can write stories with sensitivity that a Black person could bring to that story. So I've seen that a lot. And I think that often in children's literature, when you look at this popular book, and there are several of them that are very popular mainstream novels, but when you really do the research and there's no picture there, you may find that that author is not a I mean, for example, especially a, right. A, Amazing Grace, for example, is a very popular children's book. I think the author of that is, is, is a white lady. And um, I mean, there's nothing in theory wrong with that, but it does speak to the, the, the continued problem of inequality and marginalization of, of black writers. Leslie, did you want to say anything else about that? Thanks. Yeah, we're having some technical challenges. Um, Caroline, what are the qualities that make a really good children's book for you? Number one, children have to love it. It has to resonate with children. Um, I, I have a very interesting story. One, I have never published a book without testing it out, and in many cases, multiple times, as many children as I can find and connect with. Interestingly, I met an editor at a major publisher, and we were, I was talking about my experience with children, and she mentioned that she's never been to a school. She doesn't know what children think. I mean, she literally said, I don't know what children think. <laughs> I just publish, you know, I choose the authors who are writing stories that I like. And that really is the crux of the problem. You know, here we are as black writers writing authentic stories, um, knowing that they will resonate with children because they are a reflection of our own experiences. And then you have editors 
at the publishing houses who have never stepped inside a school, have never been in front of a group of children, and frankly couldn't care less about the people. So for me, bottom line, it has to resonate with children because we we are doing healing work with our story. Whether the stories are, you know, completely entertaining, fun, silly, you know, or address uh, some of the things um, that that children have, this is healing work. And and so I find it kind of arrogance to not care what children think. Right. I mean, and that speaks to the insularity of the publishing industry kind of overall. Um, the publishing industry is made up of mostly very well-meaning white liberal people who um, feel that they are the gatekeepers, but because um, of class, education, and race, there's a, there's a feeling that they don't need to leave their office. <laughs> they don't need to go into the world of the um, that's represented by the writers that they want to publish. They know quote every damn thing. Okay, so um, I know that's really a big problem with publishing. Um, Leslie, oh, I'm almost scared to speak for technical issues, but I um, I just want to say what we were talking about earlier as far as black people, black children, black authors, not. You know, Leslie, it may be if if Am the um, it may be better for you to turn off if the camera is the problem. Turn off the camera, and we can still hear your voice. Right. Let me do. Let me do that. Yeah. Okay, can you hear? Okay, can you? Hear? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear. Okay, so what okay. were you saying? Okay, going going back to right, going back really briefly to uh, black writers not giving, you know, not being able to write the books or not being given those contracts, that really becomes a problem when you're that writer and you don't have a, a book published and you see all of these other non-black writers with the book. So that really was something that I, I, I was really looking into prior to publishing Love Like Sky. And then it, going back to the Black Lives Matter issue and the popularity of, of that theme running through our book, sometimes there is a issue, as we discussed before, of being pigeonholed. You don't, every book that we write does not have to contain that theme. Um, mm -hmm. So you sometimes, fall into that, oh, well, I have to make this um, a thing for the book to be published because that is what's really trending and what's popular. And that urge to be published may cause you to write toward trend, which we're not, to, you know, you're supposed to write from a point of, of what's authentic to you, what's true to you, not right. toward what you think the market um, to, to make your story authentic. So that is something that when we're talking about people who are really popular in the mainstream and when these books about certain issues are dominant, you know, every book, sometimes we just want a book about joy, a book about cupcakes, yes. a book about yes. other issues. Um, and we need to make sure that those books are represented as well. Now, um, before we take it, see if there's a, any questions or comments, Leslie, did you want to, did you, want to also i invited you to also to read a brief section did you want to do that or did no, you want to pass, to pass I, right, because let me, of let me the technical that, issues right well yeah, the other I thing love, is I love to read. <laughs> the other question i asked was um what is it that makes for you a really good children's book wow you know what makes for me a really good children's book you know, I love to have books where both of my books are center on family, center on extended family, uh, sibling relationships. And sometimes I find myself writing 
for children in particular who may not only recognize that, but even sometimes more importantly, who may lack that, who may lack those connections, lack that extended family, lack that, that mother, daughter, father, um, daughter, father, son relationship. So in my books, I like to consider those books family. They can jump into that. They can feel that mother's love, that grandmother's love, that sibling love. So it's important to me that I'm thinking about children who have not experienced that. So these books become a home for them. It, mm -hmm. it becomes a family. And, and, I, and, and that is what, that's what's important to me ultimately when I finish the book. Can a child dive into this novel and feel the love, feel safe, feel, feel that security that Georgie has even though they don't have it in their life, they'll know what it, it looks like when it shows up. Um, and that's one of the most important things to me. And because I value that so much, I love it and, I, and, and, and I've experienced it with all my heart that I can portray that in a book. Um, you know, and, and, and that's what makes you know, my books authentic and, and what makes me gravitate more toward continuing to write books for for, for children. Great, great. And as I, that's one of the things I love about both your books. There's this, this, um, this affirmation of black love, black family, and the fact that that is a reality no matter what we're facing. Um, so I want to now ask my technical assistant, Ramona, if we have any questions or comments at this point from the audience. Okay, the first one from E.T. Brown. How does a new author navigate agents and editors who may not understand our voice? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Caroline, you want to take that one? Well, um, that is the, the, the $100,000 million question. I, I think what's so important is to be true to who you are and true to your voice um, because you will make a way uh, for yourself and for your audience. One of the things we talked about is, you know, with the proliferation of, of stories by white authors about uh, white children, um, how that leaves black children out of the human experience. You know, uh, when these books are being introduced to children uh, from preschool on up through all their years in high school, what we see in books is reflected in American life. So it is our duty to ensure that our voices are heard and that they remain as true to our experience and the experiences of children as possible. I write primarily for children who don't have a background as avid readers. I write for children who have no books in their homes. These are children I've taught, these are children I've tutored, uh, children I've encountered in the majority of schools that I've visited. And oh my gosh, how connected uh, they get to stories when they see children like them, how excited they get. They become lifelong readers when they see their experiences reflected. So it's critical um, that we stay true to that and just keep writing because there will be uh, an editor and an agent who will recognize and respect your voice. And if there isn't, um, Caroline is a good model of how you can successfully independently publish your book. Um, Leslie, did you want to respond to this question anyway? Well, definitely. I, when you're writing your stories, have it, you know, have readers read, you know, who share your experience. Um, that's one way. And before I would submit to a publishing house, if you could possibly hire an editor yourself, a, a black editor who may be able to help you with some of the nuances um, that that black editors can bring to a story. But here's the deal: when when you are in the traditional publishing space, um, I published with with Disney, and I published with Little Brown. 
And I'll be honest, both of my writers, my, both of my editors were, were white women. They were great. Both were great editors. But you have to be grounded in your story. Know your story and, and be prepared to 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 give pushback to things that may they may want to change, but you know that you have to stand your ground on. So I, there's no one I believe in in the traditional publishing field that can guarantee you that you're going to have your book edited by a black editor. There there just too too few. So I would navigate it by under by making it the best that you can, being grounded in what you know for sure before you enter traditional publishing, because chances are, for now at least, even though it's changing, more than likely, you will not have a, a, a black editor at, at this point anyway. And the other thing is not only that you may, I mean, for example, I do, um, I work with people on manuscript evaluation and <clears throat> I sometimes will edit. I don't work necessarily with children's books, but many editors these days are so busy acquiring books that they really don't edit. So it's mm -hmm. not unusual for an editor to sign a, sign you up and then we'll tell we'll, we'll arrange to have an outside editor work with you. I've worked with people for example who um have told their agents and their publishers I want a black editor. If you don't have one, find me one. And people are black writers are getting very militant about that because of you know, the importance of the work. Okay, let's take another question. Um, Caroline and Leslie talk about how you landed your book deal, the query letter, attracting an agent, et cetera. Caroline? Caroline, we can't hear you. Thank you for that question. I'm going to tell you that every author's journey is going to be different. Um, but there are some things that you can do to help you. The book deal that I just signed did not come about with a query letter. It came about because of my relationship with the editor that developed five years ago when I hired her when she was working independently in her own editorial services company. Um, to edit Darius Daniels Game 1. And so we just kept in touch over the years. And back in November, I told her about some new picture book manuscripts that I had because she had joined a new publishing company. And uh, she said she was interested in talking and we didn't get to talk until uh, April. And as soon as she saw the manuscript, she said she loved it. And, and, and so we went to work on the book deal. But it was really about um, building that relationship. Um, she got to know me as a writer with a novel. Uh, we kept in touch. I attended a conference um, last year that, uh, where she was a speaker at. She didn't, I didn't know she was gonna be a speaker there and she didn't know I was attending. But the industry is really small. And so if you're showing up at conferences, people are gonna to get to know you. Um, I paid to have a particular manuscript, uh, a, a picture book manuscript uh, reviewed during that conference. And the editor who looked at that manuscript told me she wanted to buy it. Uh, unfortunately, that conference was really close to the initial um, uprising that happened. And that book was not about anti-racism, so it got put on the back burner. But again, um, here are two books that I didn't have to write query letters for because of the relationships that I built. But I have written a ton of query letters. Um, Leslie, how did you land your book? Um, definitely, I had to... Right, years and years in the making, and, and I definitely would, at... can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, query letters, I've, I've, I've written several, but the good thing is that you can find a query letter that I have out there now. It's on querytracker.com. Um, maybe if you can contact Marita or contact me on social media, I can give you that link, but that's out there. 
So um, exactly the query letter that landed Love Like Sky. I also attended conferences, our, our Quayley conference, and I met with eight um, editors there. And after I attended that conference and had it, you know, really read by a, a um, some interested agents, I re just revamped my query letter, and probably within two months, I landed my agent, my agent at that time. So query letter very important, and I do have an example of mine out there for you to that I, I'm happy to share with with everyone. As far as the editor, you know, once we landed, once I had the agent. That process of landing at Disney took about two weeks, and I guess that was based on their relationships. But I, I guess prior to that, what I would just like to stress is to make your go to go to conferences, um, network. There's a lot of people out there, especially African consultants and editors, that can really help get your work where it needs to be to attract the right people. Mm -hmm. Great, great. I just want to add that I. Yeah. I do not have an agent. Both of these book deals uh, came about without an agent, but I am looking for an agent for my next book deal. I, I do think it's wise to have one. Uh, just be prepared to put a lot of time and energy into it because they, you want to find a good match for you just as they are looking for a good match for them. Uh, so you have to do a lot, spend a lot of time on their websites to find out what kinds of books they're interested in, whether or not they're open to submissions, and another thing I found really helpful was uh, Googling to see uh, what news articles had been written about them. A lot of agents give interviews on, um, on publishing podcasts. And so then you really get an even deeper sense of what kind of person this is and, and, and what kind of work they've done and, and, and what they're interested in. Excellent, excellent. And I know that a lot of um, agents are on Twitter Agents are following young writers who are on Twitter and approaching them early in their careers to groom them. They're hosting um, Twitter parties where you can um, tweet your proposal. You know, so there's a lot of uh, very innovative activity going on. Uh, do we have another question? All right. I it's interesting to note that Angie Thomas landed her book deal for The Hate You Give on uh, from a Twitter um, promotion. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Very, lots of stuff out there. And I think the point that um, Carolyn raised about just spending time, I often will tell writers that I'm working with, 80% um, write, spend writing, the best writing you can do, 20% the business angle, 20% just Googling finding out what's out there, networking. But you've always got to have that great book. You cannot sacrifice the writing of the great book for networking. Uh, the next question from Janice Kearney. Hi, Janice, glad you're with us. Um, do authors have data on how many of their readers are non-Black children? That's an interesting question. Caroline? Yes, great question. I don't have any data. But what I can tell you from my experience is I'm a native of Fort Wayne, Indiana. So Indiana is a very white and a very conservative state. <laughs> when my first book came out, I actually moved back to Indiana and was invited by the Indiana Department of Education to travel to regions across the state sharing my book. The overwhelming majority of these regions, um, you know, 100% white. And I had no resistance to the story. Um, and uh, all of the books um, have an image of a black child on the cover. So I, I think that demonstrates the power of the author and the power of story. And it also demonstrates the damage that's done by gatekeepers who judge your book by its cover or judge your book by the fact that you're a black writer. And they will say, um, that this book would not be of interest to you know white students and students who live in an area that's predominantly white. That has not been my experience at all. Leslie, oh well, definitely. I, I can tell by my the letters I receive from readers, the schools that I'm invited invited to, and also libraries that a, 
a, a very large portion of my readers are, are white kids. And I definitely agree with Carolyn about the gatekeepers. And unfortunately, sometimes those, those gatekeepers are parents, are the, the people closest to the child who do not understand that this child doesn't deem this book as a quote unquote black book. It's usually Ooh. the parent or that guardian who's bringing that to the child. So when they see my little black uh, Georgie on the front, they identify with it as a girl. And if they do identify with her as, as a, a black girl, which they should, of course, that's great. But when they read it, they learn the universal. So that is really, I, I don't have an issue. I've spoken at all majority white schools. There's no issue there. But getting that invitation from the gatekeeper is the hard part. When I'm in the classroom and we're talking about love like I, and hopefully as we will forever this summer, there is no issue. Those kids relate to what kids relate to. Um, bullying, uh, love, a search for acceptance, but we have to work on the gatekeepers and marketing. And just really quickly, I had an issue with, with my first book where my marketing at Disney had some pushback with the, with the cover that I now have. That was not my original cover. My original cover was a, a big heart with a very small, lighter skin Georgie on the front. So they were already trying to put me in, or already trying to market it a more generic, quote unquote, market, as opposed to what I knew would, would, would be the best image for that book, which ultimately, thank goodness, won out when, you, when I gave a little pushback to that. Great. Um, it's Janice Kearney is down there in Arkansas, and I have a friend whose daughter uh, wrote a actually a YA book about a black girl living in Washington D.C. who loves to code, um, and she independently published it, and it really did extremely well. And Arkansas, the state of Arkansas, bought nine thousand copies of that book to distribute in the school system. So if we could, I mean, if black people can identify with white characters, white children can identify with black characters. Thank you, you these are great answers. Uh, any other questions? Next question. Um, Janetta, this is amazing. Who is writing the books? That raises question about authenticity of the story. Caroline. Yes, I, I would agree. Um, you know, she's speaking to the fact that the majority of books that feature black characters, and many of these um, are nonfiction books about our historical um, uh, figures, uh, are not written by black people. And that matters. We know we have a point of view uh, about uh, our own experiences that are very different, even from the most enlightened white writer. And again, it's not that they they shouldn't be able to write these books, but it's why is it that more of them are writing our stories than we are, when that's not true for other people of color. Mm. Yeah, Leslie? And we also have to think about also, even though there may be a, a, a Black writer and even a Black person on the cover, when you read the book, what who is centered actually in that story just because there's a black protagonist it doesn't necessarily mean that that story is centered around them they may be in area in, in situations where they are really secondary to story it may all be about trying to earn the affections or or the uh admiration of of, of a white character so how does that really play into making sure as I make sure in my books that the black characters are front and center. And I think sometimes black writers bring that to the forefront more so than the non-black writers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next comment or question. How do you balance, from Donna, how do you balance fairy, <coughs> fairy tale themes with reality? Well, I'll jump in. I'm I'm a realistic fiction writer, so I I really just I, I really basic. I, I write realistic fiction, so I haven't 
ventured in to um, anything of that of that nature. And I think a lot of people are out there. A lot of great writers are doing that. Are doing a little bit of, of both of both. But I, I mainly write realistic fiction for for my readers. I think um, you know we have the great Octavia Butler, who is a science fiction writer, and as I mention her name, I have to say um, that I have not read um, completely any one of her books, but I have lots of friends who are fans of hers. And what a, a really good writer uh, can do is take any genre and make it real. So. Um, I think it's important not to limit ourselves to whatever the genre um, suggests um, should be the should be the definition of it, um, because genres are being invented, uh, new genres are being invented, you know, over time. Just like new forms of poetry, I had no idea there were so many different forms of poetry. So people are are breaking rules, and I think that's your work as a creator is to tell a story in a way that you believe it will have the greatest impact on the reader and still maintain the truth. Uh, so that's, that's what I look for. Is it true? And actually, the, that is, the, that is so true. the traditional fairy tales that we think of when we say fairy tales are actually, when you really read them closely, are actually very serious, uh, very grim. I mean, the Grimm, the brothers Grimm were writing very grim stories about life, death, survival, betrayal, trust, lack of trust. So the fairy tales that we think are so uh, innocent on closer examination are drenched often in blood and drenched in reality. <laughs> And other that cultures, the, the fairy tales that we grew up on are not the fairy tales that other cultures have. Um, I, I read a book that said that there were at least 10 different versions of the Cinderella story, and it did not uh, originate uh, with Europeans. You know, there are African Cinderella stories that are really deep and profound. So one of the things you'll find out if you're going to be a children's writer, it, it, you'll find out more about the history, um, more about a world view of how mm -hmm. children's stories come to be. Excellent. And I, I agree, definitely. And I just want there to be selection for children. I want them to, if they choose mag magical realism, if they choose realistic fiction, you know, my my mindset is that we, they should have it all. They should be there should be so many books for them to choose from that they should be able to go from genre to genre and, and have those books available by black authors, whichever genre they choose to read. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's when we'll know there's real progress. Yeah. Next question or comment? Really? How do you balance the business of, the business of writing uh, versus writing itself? Well, let, me, let me say really quick. It, I have, at, I'll be honest, I have lately, as of late with my book publishing July 6th, um, I have really been heavy on social media and it will be, be a full-time job unless you start to set a schedule or, 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 you know, really try to focus on how you're going to handle social media. Um, so for me, with Twitter, with BookTok, which is TikTok, which um, with LinkedIn, with 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 uh, Instagram, it becomes a full time job. And I think, though, my personal take on it is that it's very important for an author to have a social media presence, and I, I really try to to grow that presence. So my my advice would just be to to learn the platforms, schedule times, to make your presence they're authentic and engaged but try not to let it encroach on your writing time but it is not something that i take lightly and, and it can be overwhelming um, unless you get a, a handle on it as you know as early as possible prior prior to publication because i was not really on any form of social media except for face facebook prior to publishing and that is one of the first things i received from my 
editor and then my publisher was what they expected from me on social media. I, I agree completely with Leslie. What I would say is first and foremost, know why you're writing. Um, not everybody who is writing is writing to make a career out of it. Um, some people just have that one book that they feel they need to get out into the world. Um, and, and so in that case, it's, it's not so much of a business. But if this is something that you want to do as a career, you're going to have to be very intentional about how you enter this space. Because as Leslie said, it can be overwhelming, it can be exhausting, it can be frustrating. Um, it is hard work. Um, so, so being clear about what you want to do and then being strategic, which Leslie also talked about uh, in terms of setting aside a certain amount of time um, deciding which platforms are going to work for you. Uh, it's very difficult to be on all the platforms um, and be effective because different platforms allow you um, to speak to your audience in different ways. Um, I recommend starting off slowly and, and building up your, your followers and your community and then branching out. But be clear that if you want to do this as a career, it is a business, and you're going to have to be like a business person. <laughs> true, true that. And Marie, true that. A second that I, would like to, I would like to to mention something really quickly that I think I would be remiss not to mention. When we were talking about about the realistic fiction versus, you know, um, someone mentioned that had the question about the fairy tale versus reality. Even though, you know, of course we can mesh genres and people are creating genres. If you're interested in traditional publishing, which is why I like talking to Carolyn because we, we have different tracks that, you know, I, I believe you're, you're publishing traditionally now. You, when you're going into that pre-letter, it's probably not the best place for you to start to invent or tell them how you're creating a new genre. That is, that, that's different. Because if, if you're going to make your road harder, not saying it cannot be done, but when we're talking about a query letter to an agent and, and you are a non-published author, it is making, it is a, a, a not, it's more uphill battle because they are gonna look for what, where can I sell this? What genre is this? So just keep that in mind when you have something inventive or different that is not out there. I'm not not encouraging people not to create it, but I'm looking at it right now from what I know about traditional publishing and it can be done, but they're gonna first say, what genre is this and how does it fit in and understand that's gonna be a challenge for you and, and when you move into that traditional publishing space. Okay. I just, amen that point, an excellent point. There are so many boxes in publishing and you're going to have to check a lot of boxes to get past the big people. Uh, but once you're in, then you can really experiment. Or the way I did it was I did a lot of experimentation before me. Let's take another question. <laughs> um, it, someone once told me you are a heck of a writer. However, you are a poor businesswoman. I do believe trying to balance the business of writing interferes with writing itself. So Barbara is having a challenge finding the balance between writing and the business. I'd like to address that because my experience, um, the business came first. I quit my job and I really didn't know what I was going to do. And all of a sudden this book was selling all high, like hotcakes and doors were opening to me. And I was making money, but... Um, when I have these dry spells, it is so hard to sell yourself as an author. Artists um, know this. It, it's very, very difficult. Um, but again, you, you have to be intentional about it. And seek out mentors. Seek out other people who do it. Look for books. I've, I've read lots and lots of books about the business of publishing. Uh, in order to learn how to do it better. Because if you want to do it, if you love to do it, if you believe you have something of value to offer uh, children and families, then you, you, you have to 
successful at it. You want to find a way uh, to survive and to thrive. So, um, you know, just be intentional. Look for resources. Um, participating in a conversation like this is obviously a great start. Um, a lot of, 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 of the money that I've had, um, disposable income, has gone into hiring editors, attending conferences, lots and lots of books. Uh, but it's worth it to me. It is. It has always paid off. Um, not because I sold a million books, but because of the wonderful letters I've gotten from children and parents and teachers telling me uh, how much those books meant to them and to children. Uh, could you or should you hire a fantastic family member artist? to illustrate your children's book. <laughs> I do have a story about a fantastic family member artist. I think that the, the point is with the fact that this person is a family member. Well, you know, to work with them. I think it depends on your relationship. I have a brother who is an illustrator. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in uh, fine art. His specialty was comic, is comic books. Um, he was initially reluctant to do children's books, but but he's done a couple for me. In fact, he gave a couple of Darius Daniels game on. Wow. And people love it. Um, we have a good relationship, um, but there is sensitivity um, when you're hiring anybody. Uh, but a family member in general, because that's a relationship that you value and that you want to keep. And so I just, you know, respected his sensitivity as an artist, learned how to offer him critiques that wouldn't make him want to shut down. Uh, but, I, but I'll share this quickly. I once hired a young woman who begged me to illustrate uh, the Obama hip hop care book. And my brother was really, really busy. So I didn't even approach him. I paid her in advance. Three weeks later, uh, we were on a really tight deadline and I didn't even have the cover. And so she just told me that all these issues had come up in her life and, and she didn't think she could do it. So, so I called my brother who was a professional illustrator and he got the book done in two weeks the entire book, 11 illustrations where she couldn't get one done in three weeks. So it's really about, not so much is it a family member, um, but what is that person's professional experience? And and can you work together on a professional level? Leslie, did you want to weigh in or? Well, I, I'm speaking just from the traditional published mindset, I, I, I probably, the way that it has worked for me is that the publisher hired the illustrator and I didn't right. have any say so in that, but I was just, I was just blessed to have the wonderful Vashti Harrison illustrate. So I don't think that would be, that's probably not something you'll run into or have that option for in, in, in a lot of publishing settings. But independently, of, of course, if the work is good and it would sell, I wouldn't mind working with a family member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take one or two last questions. Um, if we have any more. Could you expand more on the ground roots work? I'm not sure what that question means. Um, so, you know, I have a perfect... I think we. I think well. I, I remember mentioning ground roots work as far as when getting our books into the hands of black oh, kids. Is, is that what they were okay. referring to? Okay. Um, but, when we were trying yeah. to get so, and sure. I, that a lot of the root, the lot of that is, is grassroots. I can't, grassroots. I can't really depend on my publisher to do that. Um, so grassroots for me, and now it, it means just personally going out and understanding that this is a place where I believe that my book would sell or this is some uh, uh, organization that I would like to work with. There's pros and cons for that. Um, the, the cons, of course, is that it's very time consuming because that's time away from the business of writing or time away from actual 
doing the work. But say, for instance, right now on, on a smaller level, I'm traveling um, unexpectedly this this um, week. And I just decided to have uh, posters, those magnetic posters you have for your car. I said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a business person. People use these magnetic posters on their cars when they're when they're selling things. I'm an author. That's a business. So I had one made for our car on both doors. To me, that's that's what I mean about going outside of boxing and doing more grassroots right. as right. far as organizations, personally reaching out to organizations and, and offering yourself as a, a speaker and not depending on my agent, even though I have a great one and my publisher, even they're huge, but I, Leslie Youngblood, Leslie C. Youngblood would always be the best person in the face of both my books. So as much as I can to, to go out and, and, and really talk to those gatekeepers or write those letters and, and present my book um, to, to people who can get it in the hands of kids or showing up at the Boys and Girls Club and, and working with those kids. You can't get more grassroots than that. Than <laughs> saying here to these kids, speaking to these kids and, and working with them one one. Well, more and more, the publishing industry really puts an enormous amount on the author from the fact that when you um, have a book, you are expected to come to your agent almost with a book that's finished. Once you get the book signed, the editor is expected to do very little editing. You're often given a 40, uh, a 20 page author questionnaire where you fill out all the people you know, all the contacts you have. And this goes back to the insular nature of the publishing industry. You know, they're sitting in their offices. They really don't know a lot of this stuff and they're not interested in knowing it because they're putting so much on you as the author. So many authors are not prepared for this part of the job of being a writer. So it's 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 a lot. It's more than a notion. And it's, it's, it's a hard part. I remember they have a they have a machine and that machine that has worked for a white writer put, putting your ads here and there it not work for me mm -hmm. so when i had one pr person when i looked at where they were sending my books and where they were sending me to that was not my demographic not my target audience but yet thousands of dollars were being spent and i i you know, it's, it's a, it's, you have to do some correction there. You have to have those conversations and you have to have that confidence to say, Hey, keep in mind, it will always be a job for them. Whether it's your agent, they will leave, they will resign. And so will your pup. So will your, your editor, your agent, your PR person, I've had them all leave and resign. What will always remain is that that is your book. You will be, that is your Passionate. They yeah. may be passionate about that field, but their book, they only they may, they're only passionate about your book because they're hired for that company to some degree. You know what I mean? But you're they don't have the same passion and shouldn't be expected to that you have. And and I think we can't leave it in their hands. So I, I really try to do as much as I can to take my book, my you know, into my hands and the publisher should do as much as they can. But Leslie C. Youngblood. Leslie C. Youngblood is going to try to do the best she can. And it's a lot. <laughs> so, okay. And the cycle, the life cycle is about 90 days. Love. The life cycle is about 90 days. You're, you're, yeah. You do all this preparation for the pub and date the and you get about three months of actual contact with your publicist. After that, bam, they're on to a new writer. <laughs> so you, it really is on yeah. you. They're on to the next thing, and that's right. And I think, let me just say this I think sometimes, especially when we're talking about self publishing versus traditional publishing, I hear this all the time. There is there is no la la land when you traditionally publish. publish. For most cases, there's some lightning in a bottle that happens to people, but for the most of us, um, that is not the case. We are out, out here hustling, we have magnetic 
posters on our cars. I'm passing out <laughs> bookmarks in, in the Hilton. I'm doing what I need to do. It is not that I'm on the, the Today Show because I published with Disney, because I published with Little Brown. It, it is not that. And we have to stop thinking that one thing we have to clear up that tradition that self-publishing is viable and doable and you can be successful we also have to clear up that when you traditionally publish that does not open up that million dollar door for you and we have to have that understanding you could work just as hard and 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 we just have to to clear that up for people who think that's the holy grail it it is it, it, it can be but it is it it, it is not this instantaneous I have made it that people think it is sometimes. Carolina, we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I switched microphones because I was getting a lot of feedback through. Um, uh, Leslie again is absolutely right. What I didn't know, and what most authors don't know, is that 95% of uh, authors who have books sold through traditional publishers sell 5,000 or fewer books. That is not enough money to make a living off, not enough books. Um, but that's, that's the standard. So um, you do, if you want to go beyond those 5,000 books, you're going to have to hustle. You're going to have to tap into the grassroots, the top roots, everybody you know. You, you know, you, you really do have to hustle, but it, it can pay off. Um, I owe my career uh, to two people. First, to a 12-year-old boy named Miles, who was living in a group home. And within a few months of Terrifying Sunshine on a rainy day coming out, I was invited to the group home to read the book to 55 boys and girls. Miles was in that group. He wrote me a letter that said the book changed his life around. That gave me so much life. It changed my life around because as I said, I was an accidental children's author. I had not planned on a career uh, in children's books or literature or even um, literacy training, but knowing that that book meant so much to Miles and seeing the impact it had on so many more children really gave me the confidence to keep going. And then the other person who's responsible for my career is my mother. She was a beautician. She had a one chair beauty salon um, when my first book came out and she literally sold my book like hotcakes out of her salon. Uh, in the course of 10 months, she sold about 400 books in, in a, in a, in a one-room beauty salon. Uh, that also gave me a lot of confidence, and it built a community of supporters, including a woman connected with the Indiana Department of Education, who ultimately, uh, that relationship allowed me to sell thousands of books across the state. Well, I think this is, this is a perfect segue um you know even writers haki matabuti uh nikki giovanni elin harris all sold their books early in their career out of the out of the trunk of their cars so there's a long and honorable tradition of hustling in uh, the american literary uh world walt whitman the great poet was a penultimate hustler he wrote reviews of his own poetry books um, and had them published in different um, newspapers and magazines. So we are creatives and we are hustlers. <laughs> We're proud to be, the, to be that. I want to thank Caroline <laughs> and Leslie for a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I mean, we covered so much. Um, great questions, great answers. Um, I really want to encourage everybody to uh, read Caroline's work, to read Leslie's books, to follow them on Twitter. And um, Leslie, your new book is coming out when? My new book publishes, which is forever this summer. It publishes July 6th, and it is about family, friendships, fun, a lot of black girl joy 
and in that we tackle some well, I tackle some challenging subjects such, such as Alzheimer's and and bullying. So please um, join me for the book release and please follow me on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, wherever you can find me. I'd love to with you and answer any additional questions you may have. And Caroline, you will be announcing officially more about your forthcoming book in a couple of months, correct? Absolutely. In the month of July, you should be hearing a lot from me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram about um, the deal with the new book, uh, when it'll be coming out, what it's about, and um, happy also to answer any other questions that we didn't get to at any time. Well, I want to give you both a hand. And I really, I've been looking forward to this because even though many of the young people in my family have asked me to write children's books, that's just not where, I'm just not called to write those books, but I love children's books because they're stories and I love a good story. Um, I want to thank again, everybody who joined us today. I want to wish everybody- Marita, can I just say one? Yeah. Marita, I, I have to say, going back years ago, before I published uh, my first novel, we, we were working together. She told me something that really Leslie, you're going in and out. You're going in and out. I would just like to add, I think Leslie was going to tell a story about how fantastic it has been to work with you Marina, as, a, as a coach. And, and I just want to say amen to that. I am uh, delighted uh, to have worked with you and taken one of your courses. And I look forward to taking more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, happy, happy summer to everyone. My next creative conversation will be on October 12th. And it will be um, a conversation around my new forthcoming book, um, The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. Um, in the next two months, you'll be hearing from me a little more about that book. And I uh, hope everybody has a great summer. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a great summer. Bye-bye.